Well, first and foremost, guys, thank you so much for taking the time to film this fan Q&A interview with IGN. I'm Terry Schwartz, and with me is the incredible director and cast of Dunkirk. Uh, we asked for fan questions, and we got so many incredible responses. So it was really hard to pick our favorites, but we did curate a few. So first, I want to introduce our incredible panel. We have director Christopher Nolan, we have stars Finn Whitehead, Harry Styles, Barry Keoghan, Mark Rylance, and Jack Loden. Thank you guys all so much for being here. Um, now, so these are fan questions, but I'm cheating a little bit because this is a fan question for me. Uh, but Mr. Nolan, I'm curious, why was the story of Dunkirk one that you wanted to make into a film? Uh, for me, like most British people, it's a story I grew up with. I, I don't even remember the first time somebody told me the events of Dunkirk. We grew up with it as a, it's almost a myth or a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. As a storyteller, you're looking for some kind of gap in the record. You're looking for a story that should have been told that hasn't been. And this hasn't been taken on in, in modern movies. So to me, it's just the most exciting opportunity to tell a great story that I've known about for a long time that has such cinematic aspects to it, between the land, the sea, the air. Uh, it's, it's just very, very exciting opportunity. Well, Finn, this question is from you from Tara Gilmore on Facebook, and she wants to know, what's the one thing that impacted you when researching, and how did you apply it to your character? Um, I think the thing that really got to me was just the desperateness of the situation and the lengths that a lot of soldiers went to to try and get home. Um, there was a lot of accounts of people trying to swim the channel, which under the conditions and the fatigue they all were in, and um, you know, the gear they were wearing, it was just it was impossible and a lot of them knew they were basically committing suicide by doing that so I think that was just a very it's like a very sobering detail to learn about this event and just kind of added a I guess a layer of subtlety that I felt I needed to have I think we all felt that especially being in Dunkirk it's like a very real thing and I think that the atmosphere there is very kind of yeah it's palpable with it. It's incredible that you guys shot on location at Dunkirk yeah, I mean, it wasn't really something that we had planned initially. We went there to see what the reality was and what remained. And uh, after a few days of walking to beaches with my designer and my DP and Emma and myself, it just became inevitable that we needed to be there. You, you walk that beach and you feel the history that's there in the sand under your feet. And uh, it, it just drew us in and it felt like something we really, really had to do. So Harry, this is a question from you from Potato Directioner on Twitter. Uh, they want to know, why did you audition for Dunkirk? Why was this a movie you wanted to be a part of? Um, I think uh, when I first heard uh, that Chris was going to be making this film, I think it just excited me straight away to watch it as a fan. Um, and uh, I think if you're a fan of movies and a fan of Chris, it, it's impossible to not kind of instantly want to be involved in something like that. And uh, yeah, now I just feel all right about being in it. Uh, Jack, this one's for you from Niam Cunningham on Facebook. What was your experience acting in a plane and what were the challenges? Because I believe it was a pretty, you pretty much shot on your own, correct? You were separate from the rest of the cast yeah, when you were filming. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. It was um, strange to do a part in this film and really be on your own for a large part of it. It was great. It was a very strange experience. It was almost like doing a big self-tape. You know, to a certain degree, like the most expensive self-tape <laughs> you could do. Um, but it was great. I mean, it's it's knackering being inside one of those things. It's like it is like sitting in a wheelbarrow with you know a washing machine going off at the same time. They're very noisy and they're hot. And I mean, those guys must have been knackered by the time they even got towards where the action was. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was an incredible experience and. Um, yeah, one I'd recommend. And Chris, this is something you can talk to a little bit as well, but a lot of your scenes in the movie show you with Tom Hardy, but I'd imagine that you didn't necessarily get a chance to shoot together that often. So how did you sort of create that dynamic? No, I mean, actually, you know, at, at certain times, Jack had to be acting on his own up in the plane and you know, Tom had to be on, on, on his own, but quite often we're able to put the other actor on the end of the radio, mm. so they'd be communicating uh, as they would you know over the radio uh, as they are on the film and uh, it's great when you can actually do that and, and have the dialogue go back and forth between the actors so they're not you know defining their performance before they know what the other actors doing uh, so where possible we would, we would get a genuine interaction between them over the radio but yeah they had to be on their own when they were uh, going in that cockpit. Uh, Barry this one's for you from Mads on Twitter what was the hardest scene for you to film? 
uh, artist. I don't know. Um, as spoiler free as possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to say so. Would have been a scene with Jack because he always made it tough for me. No, I don't know. Probably getting on the boat, you know, because that was the that was the point where I had to choose like whether I wanted to get on or off. And like, you know, he's looking for an adventure, George, and it's it's actually a it's a it's a big choice, like you know. Um, so yeah, that would have been a tough one. Uh, so this is a question from everyone from Audrey on Twitter. Did you all know about Dunkirk's history before auditioning? Uh, yeah, I did, um, but not in as much detail as I do now. I think. Um, like Chris has said before, you do grow up learning about it. I think by the time I was learning about the war and history, it was kind of skated over a lot of the time in the syllabus. We learn about a lot of other events, but maybe it's something to do with Dunkirk being seen as a military failure in a lot of ways. Um, you don't go into massive detail about it. I'm curious, sort of as a follow-up, what is sort of the most interesting thing you learned about it after filming this movie that you didn't realize going in? in any the case? civilians that went over, wasn't it? Um, you know, they, there was what, there was so many that went over, it was just participating and yeah. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of it is just bringing the human aspect to it. I think when you learn about it, it's obviously told in, like Chris has said, this fairy tale way of there were people stranded and people came and got them and then they went home and it was great. Um, and I think with this, it's, it's so intimate you're in kind of with the characters and going through a lot of what they're going through and it's it's, uh, it's so much more real and it's you kind of get to see how scary it might have been it's not just they came to get them and they went there and I think by using the you know the different threads of, of characters you realize that it's not just two people who went through kind of all this chaos it's each individual person had something awful happening within kind of just their little thing and that was going on all around them so I think it's just kind of bringing it to that human level rather than telling the story as a group of 400,000 men you're telling individuals stories which is obviously so much more emotional than kind of lumping it all in together. Yeah. The, the amount of troops that Churchill had said he wanted to bring home and how low it was compared to the amount that actually were brought home by the civilians. I just thought that was insane. Yeah, he was asking, they thought they could maybe get 45,000, and in the end they evacuated 338,000. So it's just an order of magnitude. It's, you know, uh, a remarkable achievement, or as Churchill later said, uh, you know, within that defeat there was a, a victory. And that's one of the reasons it's, it's such an incredible tale. And Mark, so you play one of the civilians who goes to, to rescue the people on the beaches of Dunkirk. Did you have a chance to connect with any of the other civilians who did go and try to, to save these people? I don't think many of them are alive That's fair. now. <laughs> uh, I, so I didn't go to graveyards and try and channel. Just channel and really connect with them there? No. Yeah. What sort of research did you do for the role? I, I tried to not do too much research. I just went to the Imperial War Museum and listened to some recordings that were made before these people passed away and that, that's, that's, I'd, I'd recommend it, it's very interesting to, to hear their accounts. So yeah, I'm being facetious, but you can find out, you can find out uh, from books and from museums what, 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 uh, what happened to people. Um, so Chris, this is for you, uh, from ba Brandon Berry on Facebook. How many practical effects versus CGI were used in the making of the film? Well, um, really, there's very little uh, in the film that isn't derived from real photography of some type mm -hmm. or another. So we tried not to have anything in the film that's entirely CG. I think computer graphic, computer graphic imagery, uh, the patina of it doesn't really mesh well with the reality that we're trying to shoot for by shooting on IMAX and extremely high definition and uh, you know with great color reproduction and all the rest. So we tried to use more old fashioned techniques. We tried to use false perspective sets, um, paintings for, to build out a number of troops. And we tried to marshal a lot of real elements. We tried to have you know thousands of extras. We had real planes, we had real ships. Uh, so there are a lot of old fashioned techniques that have gone into it and there's very little 
in the film that's that's completely CG. Everything has some basis in, in some kind of real photography that we were able to do. Well, sort of a follow-up um, from Yes That Mr. Nice Guy on IGN.com. Uh, he wanted to know, what was the biggest challenge of filming a movie of this scope, especially since you're relying on old-school techniques? Well, I mean, each story strand has, has a lot of technical challenges to it. I mean, the aerial unit is particularly challenging, really trying to put the audience in the cockpit of a Spitfire and dogfight with the enemy. But I've done complicated uh, area work before, so I had a, I've never done anything like this, but I had some basis to work from. What I'd never done is work with boats, and we had what I gather is the largest marine unit in film history, you know, more than 60 boats on certain days. And so to be out there uh, with a team trying to coordinate that and get, get the elements in the right place at the right time, that was extremely challenging. But we had a great team of people who maximized our resources tremendously. Uh, this is a question uh, for everyone from Cass on Twitter, and especially is interesting to me, like considering different groups of you were the land, the air, and the sea. But what, were any of you scared or nervous during any particular scene that you were shooting that just you know sort of felt so real and visceral as you were filming it? Um, I think there was there was definitely one day when we were out on the ocean that that was I guess the most. Uh, surreal in terms of just your kind of senses um, being stimulated I guess it was you know we were swimming and there was kind of uh, hundreds of people in the water screaming there was a giant ship and planes flying overhead and I think that was kind of the most visceral experience of, of in terms of one kind of moment of the most going on kind of technology. Anyone else? Um, I mean, uh, the planes coming towards you, and that was quite, yeah. you know, it's, it's really coming in formation. With actual planes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. yeah. And they seem very low over our heads, they were very loud. There was one stage where we were like, should we uh, <laughs> up off for yeah. sure? It's, it's all right, Chris, are we rolling? Or? Yeah. You know? <laughs> He's like, no, you are staying here. I want this to feel yeah. real. Yeah. We had very good pilots. Uh, and uh, yeah, we really wanted to give these guys the reality of moments like when a bomber flies right overhead and, and Barry's character has to respond to that. It's a key moment in the film. And I really wanted to try and put together a production where these guys wouldn't have to, they wouldn't have to be using their considerable talents to imagine those elements. They'd be free to just react and, and concentrate on the truth of, of their characters. Uh, this is another question for everyone from Marion on Twitter. Did any of you know someone, like from your family or, or friends of family, who was in Dunkirk during the evacuation? Um, I have a, a friend who has a grandfather who had uh, who sailed over actually, and I believe he still has his boat and it has bullet holes in it. Um, so it's kind of interesting. I think it's it's pretty amazing for you know people like that to kind of. Uh, I think it just meant so much to people, I think, which you can tell from, you know, the amount of, of ships that were there at the actual time that were involved in the film. Um, you know, the fact that those guys kind of get together and still sail around with each other, it's such, a, it's such an important kind of piece of history for people. Did anyone else? Um, I think survivors at the time are quite few and far between now, so um, it was quite hard to find someone to talk to who was actually there. Um, my granddad is ex-military, so I talked to him about just kind of being a soldier and being a young soldier and his first experiences kind of going into battle, particularly your first, your first time. Um, but no, I didn't know anyone who was actually there. I think what's so interesting about the movie too is it's such sort of like a harrowing story of survival as well. It's like these people want to live. And I'm curious sort of what were the challenges of, of conveying that like it's heroism, but also just like that fight to survive. It's very, almost like a thriller in that element. That's, I think that's just like such a hard place to put yourself in and try to imagine. Cause I mean, Chris made it a lot easier with the sets and these worlds that he creates, but it's such an alien experience to most of us in the very blessed positions we're in to imagine that you're on the run all the time, that you're fighting for your life like 24 seven. That it's, it's really just doing as much research as possible, I think. Um, as much prep and just being open to your surroundings on the set that Chris creates. Uh, so last question uh, for you, Chris, from Tia Lawrence on Facebook. Um, we got a lot of questions about the filmmaking techniques. I feel like we could spend an hour just talking about that, but I thought this was interesting. Um, 
Tia Lawrence wanted to know, how likely do you think your push for a 70 millimeter exhibition might lead to the preservation of theaters, which large screen format and 35 millimeter prints? Well, I think what we've seen in, in recent years is a growing acknowledgement of the magic and the importance of celluloid film as, as its own medium. And so, you know, Warner Brothers pushing out 70 millimeter prints in this to 150 odd locations. It builds on what uh, Quentin did with Eight for Eight with about 100 locations, and what we ourselves did with, with Interstellar before them with about 10. Uh, I think there's a, there's a growing appreciation of, of the analog world that we all live in uh, and film's relationship to it because the extra resolution, the, the, the natural color that you get, the analog color, uh, it gives you uh, an experience that you can't ever have uh, at home on your television or you know on your phone or whatever. You know, we're, we're giving people a reason to get out of the house and go and seek out that, that version of the film, and, and I think there's value to that, and hopefully uh, more and more people are going to understand the value of that. This is a question I saw uh, pop up a couple times, but I'm curious as well. I feel like with each of your movies, you inch closer and closer to having just a full-fledged IMAX film shot entirely <laughs> on IMAX cameras. Do you think that's a reality in the future? Would you like to do that at some point? Well, I mean, this film, to all intents and purposes, is probably as close to that as, as you'd ever need to get. I mean, the whole film shot large format, and 75% or so is, is actual IMAX large format. Really, the limiting factor has always been uh, whether you're prepared to loop ADR dialogue or not. And I don't like to do that. I like to get the natural performances and natural dialogue. And so the cameras are a little too noisy. So for the intimate dialogue scenes, we shot on 65 mil. But 65 mil is what you know Lawrence of Arabia was shot on or uh, so forth. So it's not much of a step down. And we were able for the first time to photochemically and in a totally analog way blow up those negatives to, to match. So on our IMAX prints and our 70 millimeter prints, it's a totally photochemical, totally analog print for the first time we've been able to do, and we're very, very excited about that. Well, thank you all so much for taking the time for participating. Thank you everyone at home for your amazing questions, and make sure to check out Dunkirk when it hits theaters on July 21st.